Well, hello everybody and welcome. I um, hope you all are staying safe and uh, following the mandates and the directions from your, your city, county, and state officials. Uh, my name is Stephen Greenman. I'm in Southern California and I'm also sheltering at home like many of you, but chomping at the bit to get back to my office so that uh, we can start helping people again. Um, Today, I wanted to talk about incorporating the treatment of snoring and sleep apnea into your practices as a, a revised um, business plan uh, to help your practices to weather this storm that's going on and to grow it uh, as we come out of this. Um, it's a great time now to work on your business because we really can't be working in our businesses. So that's the purpose of what I want to talk about today. And I'll get more detail about some of the, the topics as we go a little bit for, further forward. But I wanted to at least let you know who I am and what my background is. I graduated from UCLA uh, School of Dentistry in 1981. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I went to college at UC San Diego. So, you know, I'm a real California boy. Um, I got my of course, I got my California dental license right after dental school, uh, and I've also got other permits as well. I earned my um, IV moderate sedation permit uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and I also became a, a diplomat of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine uh, around about six years ago. I'm a restorative dentist. I also do surgeries as well, like many of you that are on this call. And really what I want to stress is that you can augment your normal dental practice with dental sleep medicine, really help a lot of folks and add significantly to your bottom lines. Uh, so just a few examples. These are actual cases that, that I've done over the years. Um, so you can see a little bit of Invisalign, uh, some uh, you know, full mouth uh, restoration, cosmetic restoration, if you will, and even uh, surgical placement of dental implants and the restorations. So I'm probably similar to many of you in, the pract in, in your practices with what I've added. And I've uh, attended uh, very comprehensive programs in aesthetic dentistry, uh, fixed prosthodontics, uh, an advanced occlusion re residency. I've trained for early third molar removal, um, and of course, surgical dental implantology. I've, I, I've already mentioned that I have my IV sedation permit, but I put sleep apnea in purple because out of all of these services that I've added to my practice, dental sleep medicine and treating sleep apnea has had the biggest impact, not only on my life, on my patient's life, but also on the economics of my practice as well. And, you know, could it be your purple cow too? And that's what the whole topic of our talk tonight or today is about. And I hope you're uh, you know, able to enjoy it. Um, now I wanted to introduce our host, um, Brad Newman of Dentainment. Brad um, can tell you a little bit about his company, Dentainment. And I also want to introduce one of my friends, uh, somebody that I've worked with. He and I actually sat for the boards together to get our diplomat status. So I'm going to have Brad take it away right now. Wonderful. Well, thanks for inviting me to, to join everyone. It's an honor to be here. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Dr. Greenman. Hi, Dr. Dunn. Pleasure to virtually connect. I uh, hope everyone who's tuning in and uh, you're all doing well. Uh, much love and big hugs. Uh, as Dr. Greenman said, I'm the founder and uh, chief buzz officer of Dentainment and Robotiki uh, marketing-based agency really focused on video, beautiful, clean web design. Uh, we actually did DSM's website and Dr. Greenman's website. So, uh, just love flat minimalistic design, but uh, one of my favorite things to do is just talk with leaders in the industry and people who are doing innovative things from a, a business standpoint, an entrepreneurship standpoint, and at top of the list is, you know, Dr. Greenman and Nicole, what they've created with DSM Solutions. It's quite extraordinary, um, and it's an honor to have Dr. Dunn on this call. So I first want to just kind of start this off by asking Dr. Dunn, if you could tell us just a little bit about your practice and, and what kind of dentistry are you doing right now? Well, um, hi, good evening, and, and thank you for having me uh, be part of this. Um, you know, as uh, Dr. Greenman, I um, am a restorative dentist. 
um, and and still am. Uh, you know, I do um, a lot of crown and bridge cosmetic dentistry, implants, endodontic treatment in my practice. But um, what I've really done over the years is develop um, a full time sleep practice within my practice. Um, and uh, I think I share similar uh, passion with sleep as he does. Um, I think it has tremendous impact on our patients. So I think the profile of our practices are quite similar. Beautiful. And why did you decide to basically start incorporating dental sleep medicine in your practice? And overall, how would you say DSM Solutions has helped you? Um, you know, that's a great question. So first of all, I had a personal interest in sleep apnea because I have it myself and uh, wore CPAP for years and was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with it. Um, I think beyond that, it did become one of my purple cows. I decided that I, uh, I wanted to bring some other services uh, into my practice and uh, grow my practice with it. And um, I just feel that in dentistry, we can play a integral part and being part of the treatment team, along with physicians and, and other health professionals, in helping to screen and uh, treat for this disease with a different approach than just CPAP. So that's really what drove my passion into doing it. I think I started dabbling in sleep years ago, but really about eight years ago, got very serious with it and started with my own education and decided that if I really wanted to bring sleep up to the level that I wanted it to be, it was critical for me to uh, it, it, uh, continue my training as well as my dental team, because I think the important thing that everyone on this call um, needs to understand is that it's important for us to train our team as well if we're going to successfully implement sleep into our practices. And that's where I first uh, came aboard with um, DSM. I did some training with uh, Dr. Greenman, and I had my team do uh, training separately to bring them up to speed. And uh, I think our professional uh, uh, relationship, Dr. Greenman and mine, has continued on since that time. As he said, we sat for the boards and, and compared articles as we were preparing together. And um, it was a great process. That's fa fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Um, how would you describe, uh, you know, a typical day of obstructive sleep apnea in, in the practice? Like who leads the appointments? Who talks to the patients? Who closes the quote unquote deals? Okay. So what we have done over time, uh, you know, when we first started in sleep, I was very involved in that process. But I think as you get, uh, as you start having more patients in your practice, it becomes increasingly difficult for the dentist to do that by themselves. I mean, you can do it, but then you're not going to be doing any of the restorative because of the amount of time that it takes to treat the sleep patients. So over time, uh, I trained uh, one of my team members, Jessica, and uh, she uh, essentially runs the sleep part of our practice. She is the one that communicates with the physicians, gets all the documentation that we need, uh, does the initial screenings with the patients along with my guidance, collecting the sleep studies, interfacing with the billing, medical billers. Um, she's really the one that helps run the show. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, so as I had said earlier, um, you know, she is running a full-time or helping me to run a full-time sleep practice um, as I'm also doing restorative dentistry, you know, with my oversight and I come in and out of the rooms as patients are there, but she is really handling the great amount of the work. Well, that's huge to delegate uh, to the right team member, and that's fantastic that Jessica's all over it. I do feel like maybe a perceived barrier to getting started for a lot of practices might be the billing, right? So how would you describe the billing process? You know, how does your office mitigate billing problems with insurance companies? 
And basically, how do you, how do you handle finances with the patients? So early on, we made a decision that we were going to use a medical billing company to handle our sleep. It's entirely different than anything we've done in dentistry. And I didn't feel that we necessarily had the expertise on board to do that. It takes a lot of time. So that's what we have done from the start is we've worked with a medical biller. Um, Jessica spends a, a considerable amount of time daily um, via email, et cetera, in communication with the company as we deal with issues with uh, patients' uh, medical insurance. And there are many of them. Um, you know, you'll run into obstacles. The insurance sometimes will deny coverage, so you have to resubmit. Um, very often, we also apply for um, in-network to get patients better um, coverage, and uh, we're able to do that because there really is no one in our area doing that much sleep. There certainly aren't any boarded sleep dentists in the area, so we're very often able to get that for our patients, which gets them better coverage. So that's basically how we have handled the, the billing side of it. Um, we basically, what we do is, um, we work with the, uh, insurance companies. We pre auth with every patient to make sure they do have coverage. Uh, if they don't, then it becomes a self pay item for them, but we do accept, um, you know, their, their insurance company's payment as payment towards the service. Their out of pocket in that situation would be things such as, you know, co-pays, and, um, you know, any deductibles that they haven't met yet. And again, you know, I think that's a, an area where each practice has to decide for its own how they feel it is best to do that. In our particular geographic location, working with the insurance companies and accepting payment, um, including with Medicare, um, seem to be the best thing for success for us to close cases. Um, I know there are many dental sleep practices that um, that uh, uh, essentially uh, collect the fees from the patients and then help them get reimbursed by their um, medical insurance. Uh, either way is fine. You just have to determine what's best for your area and your practice. That, that's a great point, and, and thanks for mentioning that, Dr. Dunn. I know, you know, so every market's different. Amira is different than... New York City, it's different than California, but kind of big picture thing for anyone starting out implementing dental sleep in their practice, are there any, now we don't have a gazillion, uh, a lot of time to talk about this, but any tidbits of marketing wisdom to share? I think rumor has it you might be a big radio person. Do you recommend billboards? Like where do you see sleep and marketing kind of coming together for the greatest success? Well, I, I, we did a lot of things at the beginning to really, uh, you know, get the word out that we were doing sleep. Um, at first, we did a lot of radio ads, as you had just mentioned, and that seemed to work very well for us. It got the awareness up. We got the phone ringing. Um, uh, we did do, you know, I also enhanced our website to support that, that that was a service we were now um, um, doing at our practice. Um, from there, I have moved into some billboards, but that is more recent, so I really can't give you the, um, the ROI, so to speak, on that, on how well that's working yet, but the, uh, the radio ads work very well. But during that same time, I was also working on building, um, you know, rapport um, with our local physicians, sleep physicians, and developing referral patterns, because that is really a huge part of developing a, a robust a robust sleep practice if that's the direction you want to go in. That's that's so huge. Thanks for sharing that. Moving forward, uh, how do you see dental sleep medicine playing a role in your practice as we hopefully return to our regular programming in, here in the in the coming weeks and months? Well, you know that's a great question. And actually, Dr. Greenman and I were talking about this the other day, and. Um, you know, I think there are some great unknowns when we return to work. Uh, I mean, first of all, there's, uh, you know, many practices may not be booking as heavily to allow for um, better social distancing of our patients and team members. 
uh, allowing for uh, increased, you know, um, sterilization, et cetera. So I think schedules are going to be less crowded. Um, we don't know how many patients are going to stay away from our practices when things reopen. There's still, unfortunately, a lot of people that are very scared, people that are at high risk, um, that may not want to return for our services immediately. And I think beyond that, um, this whole crisis has severely affected many people financially so that when they do return, they may not be able to do some of the elective procedures they were able to do before. I think all of this is going to contribute to creating possible slower times in our practices. And I view that as a perfect time to be implementing something new, such as sleep, because it takes time to do that. There's the medical billing part that you need to put in place, the marketing, developing rapport um, with physicians, which perhaps may take the greatest amount of time. And I think the most important thing, education. And again, you know, uh, uh, dental DSM, is a, uh, a, a perfect way for those that don't have a lot of experience with sleep to get that under their belt and continue on from there. Yeah, it's tremendous. You're spot on. I think it's a, a great opportunity to implement it. <clears throat> Maybe do some virtual lunch and learns around sleep. Um, educate, educate, educate. And uh, but thanks for sharing all that about the referrals and the radios. Uh, very, very interesting. You know, nowadays, maybe the new radio could be even Spotify advertising, right? Um, and really targeting on that. So um, great stuff. Lastly, Dr. Dunn, um, for offices that are interested in becoming diplomats, diplomats of ABDSM, can you tell us about that process, please? Right. So actually, there are two pathways that someone can um, – follow if they want to become a diplomat. When Dr. Greenman and I did it, there was only one way, and that was what is now called the traditional track. Uh, that program has been somewhat modified, and, um, and uh, in that, uh, it requires the uh, dentist to spend time in the sleep lab, get letters of recommendation from two uh, board-certified sleep physicians, and submit a number of cases. When we did it, um, you had to submit 15 cases that met uh, certain criteria. And to get those 15 cases, you probably had to do 50 or 60 cases to get the, the uh, correct responses. And then after that, you could sit for the board exam. That's the traditional track. That has now been changed somewhat. It is now 10 clinical cases. Um, and then um, same requirements that I discussed before, and then you sit for the board exam. Last year, the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine also introduced uh, what is called the Mastery Series, which um, comprises of Mastery 1, 2, and 3. And there are um, sort of in-house uh, uh, exams that the uh, dentist would take after each series before they pass on to the next. And each one, I believe, is like a three-day um, course, and those generally take place in Chicago. Uh, at the end of Mastery 3, those dentists can then sit for the board exam, and if they pass, they become a diplomat. Um, the Mastery series doesn't have the same number of clinical cases um, required as the traditional track. That's where it varies. But it has a, you know, a pretty um, concise, um, you know, educational pathway that's delivered in those three mastery programs. So that's sort of the difference. I think um, it really depends on what the individual dentist would like to do. You know, do you want to go do training, um, you know, uh, through the mastery one, two, or three? The traditional, you're more on your own. Um, and doing, uh, you know, a lot of clinical cases for part of that process. But those are the two ways that you can do it through the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. That's really and helpful. I, if I, yeah, and if I could just add, you know, I, I would um, 
uh, I would encourage anyone that is really serious about getting involved in sleep or want to make it a major part of their practice to strongly consider doing that. Um, you know, we're talking about how do you develop sleep in your practice. One of the ways you do that is when you talk to the physicians, you need to talk their language and you need to understand what they're dealing with. And they need to know that you have some skin in the game and that you want to do this, that you're passionate about it. Um, and that you've put the education behind it. It's one of the ways that you can build that trust and rapport and the referral. And, and, and once you start that, that process and they start referring patients and you can successfully treat those patients for them, that referral pattern will be there. And I really truly believe, I know for myself, when I went around and spoke to local physicians and they knew I was going through the diplomat process, that meant a lot because the sleep physicians have to do the same thing. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, you know, um, the medical community can sometimes view us as the ones that sort of take an impression and slap some acrylic in someone's mouth, and we call ourselves sleep dentists. And that's unfortunate. There's a way of changing that. It's all about education. It truly is. Beautiful stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, before You're we welcome. let you go, any last uh, final thoughts on anyone uh, kind of on the fence about sleep and, and potentially starting up with DSM Solutions? Um, do it. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, I mean, it's something you got to be passionate about. It takes time. And what I would encourage, and in speaking to many uh, dentists that are trying to do sleep around the country, as Dr. Greenman does, and I try to always help them. The one thing I talk to them about is being patient. I think, you know, I think one of the things that separates a DSM from these weekend warrior courses, as I call them, those aren't bad. It's a way to introduce yourself to sleep. But you can't even touch on the beginning of what you need to know in sleep in a one- or two-day course. It needs to be more comprehensive. And that's the type of thing you can get with this type of training that they offer. And, you know, that takes time. So um, I think the difference between sleep and other per perhaps areas of dentistry is it's not something that you can always incorporate immediately into your practice. It takes some time. But I will tell you, there is nothing that I have ever done in my practice in, you know, 35 plus years that has been more rewarding or more gratifying than doing sleep. It's been a long haul, and at times it's been frustrating, um, but it's worth every bit of it. And that's what I would say. Just stick with it. Don't give up if it's something you want to do. You will make it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Dr. Greenman and Nicole, uh, anything, for, uh, anything else for Dr. Dunn? Dr. Dunn, thank you for that inspiring uh, overview of sleep at your practice. Really cool. You're welcome. Yeah, thank thank you, uh, Doctor Rick. Um, you know, it, it, it was um, it's been a lot of fun working with you, and quite a journey. And uh, it, it's amazing how you know how we have done very similar things, but um, haven't collaborated every step of the way. But we're so similar uh, with a, a person in our practices that is the point person that sees the patients. Um, I don't know about you, but when we get a new sleep apnea patient uh, into our practice, um, from start to finish, maybe during the first year that that person is in our practice, it's amazing that, that I'm spending probably no more than 30 minutes total time with this person and yet helping them so much. It's one of the only services that I have in my practice that is very profitable and doesn't involve my two hands uh, to produce. And uh, that, that's been just huge for me. And of course, our patients love it for us because you know, we're not sticking needles in them or drilling holes in them. So um, I, I do thank you for, for helping you know, to talk about our, our program. Um, and our program truly is a comprehensive program that will help um, anybody on the call who, who's interested to implement 
all of this, the, the features of having a, a, a well-coordinated uh, sleep practice. So thank you again. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Dr. Dunn. That was great. Wonderful. So, um, Dr. Greenman back again, and now I want to get into the, the meat of, of my talk. Um, I, I hope to be able to uh, take some questions at the end. Um, and, and I want to give a, a little bit of a, I want to give an overview of what um, dental sleep medicine is all about. Um, it may be repetition for some of you on the call, and you may be looking for certain things that, that uh, you want to implement into your practice, but I hope by the end you have a feel for um, how passionate I am about sleep and, and how passionate I am about teaching in general. I think that um, if there was a uh, you know, better living in it, I probably would be a high school teacher, uh, but I, I instead went to dental school and I get to do both. I get to teach uh, my team, I get to teach my patients, and I am very passionate about maintaining and, and enhancing a private practice. It's under assault, uh, as you may be aware, and having a strong private practice is, is paramount for me, and I want to help everybody who's on the call and who's listening to help them to get to that uh, point as well. So quality sleep, it, you know, it's in the news, okay? I mean, this was an LA Times bestseller a couple of years ago. Ariana Huffington uh, wrote The Sleep Revolution, and she come up, came up with The Sleep Revolution Manifesto, and if you can read the very bottom, transform your life one night at a time uh, and join the sleep revolution, and she had a, 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 a list of 12 um, you know, 12 points on her manifesto and talking about how critical quality sleep is. Um, poor quality sleep can result in a myriad of problems, uh, which I'm going to get into and talk about, but also um, it's been linked to early signs of Alzheimer's disease, where there's an effect on the, the gray and the white matter in the brain for sleep apnea sufferers that don't get treated. Um, this was Parade Magazine. This is this year, uh, no, it was last year, January 20th, 2019. Funny cover. Uh, here's, here's Homer. He's not sleeping well, and he's also snoring, and he's keeping Marge awake. You can see it by her eyes. And there was an episode where Homer gets a CPAP. Um, snoring has been made fun of throughout, uh, you know, you know, throughout cartoons, um, um, the Three Stooges had some very funny bits with snoring and sleep. Uh, I think one of the funniest one is when one of them would be snoring and you get hit in the head, wake up and go back to sleep would be the, uh, you know, the mantra. And I think they repeated that like, like a, um, oh, Brad, what do you call it? A, a catchphrase um, on, on many of their episodes. Uh, so, you know, it, it is something that everybody is aware of. People do talk about the quality of their sleep. It's something that we discuss. Um, this is something that can recession-proof your practice, and I, I never thought that, like, all of a sudden, I'd be talking about this happening. Um, I, I would talk about recession-proofing the practice, but hoping the recession would never happen. And here we are. Um, I can show you just some of my numbers from the last, from the so-called Great Recession of, of approximately 12 years ago. Um, I had a, a very thri a, a thriving uh, restorative practice. I was working maybe three, three and a half days per week. We were producing over a million dollars. We were doing quite a bit of, of cosmetic dentistry. Um, and people in Southern California were literally using their home equity as a piggy bank. Well, that began to slow down in, in 2007. Uh, the recession hit in, in the uh, fall of 2008. And you can see by, these, um, by this graph here that my numbers started to decline. And it was like, oh, no, holy you know what, what am I going to do? Well, it was about that time that I started adding services into my practice. Uh, 2007, 2008, I uh, obtained my... Uh, intravenous sedation permit, my moderate sedation permit, and I also trained in uh, dental sleep medicine um, with a, a professor of mine from UCLA uh, named Glenn Clark, um, and I was all raring to go, but it took uh, quite a while for me to put all the pieces together. About a 
a year for me to really get this going. And fortunately, during that recession, I had a lot of time. So I put in into place systems and I um, uh, pursued additional training. I purchased um, um, certain items that I'll talk about that were really key to making it go. And as you can see here, 2010, um, you know, we're sort of starting to barely come out of this recession. Uh, and you can see how my numbers went up. So the point where by 2011, and a lot of practices were still really, really suffering, we had our best year ever. And it was all because of dental sleep medicine. My production uh, uh, is pretty steady with, with dental sleep medicine. I, I'm typically doing about $70,000 know, per quarter. And uh, you can see here um, my income from obstructive sleep apnea alone in 2019 was $225,000. And like I said, it involved uh, very little of my time. Uh, my practice is a three day a week, 21 hour, 21 hour per week practice. I'm able to, I'm blessed to be able to take 12 weeks off per year. My team also gets quite a bit of vacation time, at least six weeks each for them. And we're a thriving practice, we're a happy practice, and I want you all to think about that because now is a good time to make some changes, and I want to be here to help you. Um, the clinical consequences of untreated obstructive sleep apnea are huge. And just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview, um, when a person has fragmented sleep because they're, having, they're not able to breathe properly during their sleep, their sleep cycles are interrupted and we call this sleep fragmentation. Now this fragmentation obviously is going to lead to uh, waking up and feeling very sleepy and unrefreshed and that's what excessive daytime sleepiness is about. But also at the same time it creates um, physiological problems and cardiovascular problems for our patients uh, with the, re re the release and the uh, inflammatory cytokines in the bloodstream. And you may have been reading about cytokines again uh, with this COVID crisis, and I think you may have read about the cytokine storm that will happen with uh, these patients that end up um, passing away, dying from complications from COVID, where their bodies uh, release these inflammatory cytokines, which are supposed to fight off infection, and in fact, then... Um, uh, will fight the body itself and, and actually, you know, destroy the organs. So the, these metabolic um, cytokines, these inflammatory cytokines, we know one in particular called C-reactive protein that we talk about with our patients that have periodontal disease. But both of these uh, conditions lead to an increase of illness, morbidity, and ultimately mortality. The consequences of uh, untreated obstructive sleep apnea are, are many. Uh, hypertension, a heart attack, stroke, congestive heart failure, dysrhythmias that will occur where the heart rate goes from very, very low uh, up to like over 100 beats per minute and it'll oscillate like this uh, multiple times per hour. Uh, pulmonary hy hypertension and core pulmonal these are both conditions where a person is, is essentially circling the drain. Uh, metabolic syndrome is also a, a, a big issue in our society, particularly for obese patients that have that central obesity, that big belly that hangs over, uh, over the belt. Um, and those, those folks have, um, they'll have diabetes or at least borderline diabetes, they'll have high cholesterol and they'll have high blood pressure. And, 80% of them have untreated obstructive sleep apnea to go along with it. It's deadly, okay? The deadly stuff happens at night in your bed. Nobody is around to help. Uh, a person will go into uh, atrial, uh, excuse me, ventricular fibrillation and go into full cardiac arrest. They will just go unconscious. Nobody knows, and they'll say, oh, you know, he died in his sleep. Um, you know, kind of like uh, Justice Scalia a few years ago at the hunting lodge in Texas. Um, other social consequences, motor vehicle accidents, poor uh, job and school performance. This has been linked to ADD and ADHD in children. Uh, obviously, family discord, depression, irritability. I mean, the list goes on and on. And ultimately, it's deadly. And this is the Wisconsin cohort study. This is a famous uh, a, a study uh, of follow-up so, uh, of 
of many patients. There's thousands of patients in this study. It's a prospective study, which means that it's a very powerful study because they can follow these folks along. And this is the group right here, AHI or AH over 30. This is the severe apneics. And I want you to look at this graph carefully. Here's the percent of folks that are surviving, and here's the years of follow-up. So here we are, according to this, 18 years, so approximately 20 years. And if you look over and see how many of these folks are actually still on this earth, only 60% of them. So that means that 60, uh, excuse me, 40% of severe apneics that do not get treated are dead within 20 years. And as dentists, we are uniquely positioned to recognize the signs of sleep apnea in our patients, more so than any other uh, um, health specialty or health, health care provider. Certainly not physicians. Uh, physicians aren't looking in the mouth and down the throat like they used to. They're pretty much sitting behind a, a, a keyboard and working on your, you know, the electronic medical record. I've had a physical last summer uh, and they didn't look down my throat. I've talked to cardiologists, I get referrals from them, and I talked to one and I said, you know, Irv, when, when you examine your patients and, and you look you know, in, in their mouth, and he stops me right there. He says, I'm a cardiologist, I don't look in people's mouth. And you know, so that's what we're kind of seeing. So as dentists, the lower third of the face is the window to the airway and will tell us pretty much what we need to know in terms of risk factor for our patients. So how about talking to your patients, your existing patients about obstructive sleep apnea? You know, what, what are some of the things that, that maybe you could start asking questions about? Um, certainly, you know, how are you sleeping? What, what's the quality of your sleep? And how do you feel in the morning? And do you feel like you've had good night's sleep? Um, are you sleeping through the night? Are you waking up? Uh, how many times and for what? A lot of these men will tell you, yeah, I wake up two, three, four times to go pee. And uh, I say, well, you know, it, it, that, that's not normal. And they say, well, you know, I'm getting older. It's my prostate, yada, yada. But um, this condition is a key, a, a key um, symptom of untreated sleep apnea. Of course, we want to ask about snoring. Snoring really is the cardinal sign and symptom of obstructive sleep apnea. But you can see here that I kind of put it down the list a little bit, because if you just come right out and ask somebody, hey, you know, are you snoring? You know, they may be a little bit put off. Uh, they may lie because they feel embarrassed about it. But you, once you've started a conversation and you kind of ask about it, you know, kind of matter of factly, well, what about snoring? What's that? What's going on there? And at that point, they, you've got some rapport and they want to talk to you. Uh, it's also important that before you ask these questions or your team does, you ask permission to ask the questions. You might say, oh, well, my doctor um, is, is trained or training in uh, treating sleep apnea in his patients. And did you know dentists are uniquely positioned to recognize it? So is it okay if I ask you a few questions? Um, not too many people are gonna say no to that. And that is kind of how you break the ice to have this conversation. And you notice that it's all questions that require more than a yes or no for the most part. So asking these questions is important. Reviewing the medical history to see if there are comorbid conditions. A hypertensive person, somebody with high blood pressure that's had to go on multiple medications before they could get it under control, well, those folks, again, high likelihood that they have untreated obstructive sleep apnea. So you really got to ask your patients about it. Uh, other questions, you know, do you know your collar size? Because uh, neck circumference is so important to know. Uh, it, do you grind your teeth? Do you wake up with morning headaches? Uh, how about ever breaking any teeth? These are all uh, issues with sleep apnea. Bruxism, nocturnal bruxism has been linked uh, intimately with uh, sleep disordered breathing, which is like the catch all phrase for sleep apnea. And again, once you've gone through some questions based on you know, what you're telling me, I, you know, I think you, you have a good chance that you have sleep apnea. Do you know what it is? People know what it is. Um, but certainly you want to ask if they're aware of the, the actual health risks of having it untreated. And you want to then ask about uh, how they feel about getting a diagnosis, because the only way to get this diagnosed is with a sleep study. And so you might ask, well, you know, how do you feel about being tested? 
And I used to ask that question, and people would look at me horror stricken because they'd heard stories about having to go into the the sleep lab. And when I could ask them, well, you know, what if you could be tested in your own bed? Uh, it was like a, a relief to hear that that was possible. I mean, can I do that? And uh, once I would let them know, yes, well, that really changed my practice because now we've got patients that are saying, okay, you know, I'll, I'll get tested. And that's how you get a diagnosis and how you can get people into treatment, which is the ultimate goal is to find out if they have it and to treat them. There, of course, are various questionnaires that you can administer in your practice. Um, I'm not a fan of handing these questionnaires to, to folks. I, I would recommend much more strongly that if you're going to administer this, you have one of your uh, team members do that. Uh, Dr. Dunn was talking about how when we get back, um, we're going to have uh, maybe um, more space between patients. We're not going to be as packed as we once were, and yet, we got our triple P uh, grant money, and we know that we want to have to keep all of our, you know, all of our employees on, and so we need things for them to do. Well, here, here, now they can actually sit and ask these questions directly to your patients. And this stop bang questionnaire is a is a good place to start, and you can then move on from there because then this gives the patient a risk factor, something that they can see. And also, you can share with their physician because you want to ask them, is it okay if I share the, the data I'm getting here with your, your doctor? I'd, I'd like to give him a call or her a call and, you know, and make sure that, that um, you know, talk to her about this as well. So this is how you now do your networking because every patient encounter in sleep is a networking opportunity to speak to a physician. And... Um, Again, I can't tell you everything that you need to know and work with you just on, on a, a you know, 30, 40 minute talk right now, but this is something that I'm passionate about and I want you to be practicing it at the highest possible level, like me, like Dr. Dunn, and we're here to help. Uh, the upper sleepiness scale, this is the, um, you know, the standard of care to get this um, uh, test done to, to find out what the, um, the level of daytime sleepiness is. This is the universally recognized questionnaire. So common clinical signs. Well, this uh, attrition uh, that you see here, uh, you also can see that there's a gigantic tongue lurking back in there. Uh, this would be a, a very high likelihood of this person having obstructive sleep apnea. So again, uh, bruxism, uh, fracturing restorations. You've all probably got patients like I have that fracture anything you know, that you'd put in their mouths. Again, part of your workup for these restorative cases, I, I think uh, certainly uh, could be a, a sleep study is, and build that into your workup with your patients because then you can get a proper diagnosis and you can see, again, how large this guy's tongue is. Um, this type of uh, uh, pitting in uh, dental, this pooling that you see where it looks like a little mini swimming pool uh, on, on the molar teeth. Well, this is again another clinical sign of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, scalloped tongue, and I used to think, you know, I was taught, you know, scalloped tongue, oh, that, you know, that means that you're bruxing, that you're grinding your teeth. Well, you know, th that might be the case that you're also grinding your teeth, but this is a cardinal sign of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, again, an old large tongue, uh, and then we can also do this mal and potty classification. So these are simple things that can be documented by any of your auxiliaries in your practice. It doesn't have to be you, doctor. And the mal and potty classification, which was developed to uh, determine the ease of intubation for um, um, you know, anesthesia for general anesthesia in a, in a hospital setting or, or in a surgery center setting. Uh, this was developed by Dr. Malampati. And you can see that the higher the classification, the more difficult it would be to intubate that person. And uh, lo and behold, this is also an indicator of the, and, and also a predictor for the presence of sleep apnea. Uh, tonsils in, in children. Uh, my passion really is uh, prevention, okay? And I, I can tell you a whole story about me, but this is not the time or the place to do that. Uh, but suffice it to say that I went through three rounds of orthodontics, uh, uh, four premolars extracted, 
um, and a full mouth reconstruction, and I never had a cavity, all because of failure to understand the importance of the airway in the growth and development of the lower third of our face. And I can't be any more passionate about this field uh, than uh, prevention, because in reality, a CPAP, an oral appliance, you know, these are Band-Aids, okay? And, and uh, wouldn't it be nice not to have this problem you know, from the start? Uh, other common clinical signs is an enlarged neck. And you can see this guy standing here and he's got a tailor tape on. And this is something you can pick up very easily. You can order them off of, of Amazon or various websites and have a few of them uh, delivered into your office so that you can measure people's necks. Because oftentimes a guy like this will never wear a normal collar shirt and a tie and so he has no idea what his neck circumference is, but this, this person, I can tell you that with, with probably a 90 degree, 90% uh, certainty has obstructive sleep apnea and probably quite severe as a matter of fact. So diagnosis, how do we diagnosis? And you may have heard of various uh, diagnostic methods if you've attended some weekend warrior courses or uh, have been approached by salespeople or what have you, but there's really only one way to diagnose, okay? And truly only a physician is qualified to diagnose. Uh, Dr. Dunn and I and others are working on changing that because uh, these physicians are so slammed um, that they're not even looking for the clinical signs and symptoms of a deadly condition. Um, and so, but at this point, only a physician can diagnose obstructive sleep apnea, i.e. interpret a sleep study. And again, I talked about how physicians do not typically look in people's mouths and they don't, just don't recognize the common clinical signs and symptoms. They're just not trained for it. So sleep testing really is the only way to obtain a diagnosis. And this is what my patients were afraid of when I was first starting out and I couldn't get them tested. They did not want to go into a sleep lab and get hooked up to 18 to 21 channels all over their body and sleep while they're being observed by a sleep technician in the other room and recorded both on video and also um, you know, on, on sound, uh, on audio. Uh, and you know, they just really didn't want to do that. But home sleep testing, I believe, is the key to dental practice success is that because your existing patient base is your one of your starting groups of patients that you want to get tested. And if you can offer a simple way, uh, an easy way to get tested, well, you know, that's the key. And that's what really transformed my practice from being trained in 2008 to really having it take off uh, in the first half of 2010. It was all about get, uh, being able to offer home sleep testing. Uh, getting tested is the only way to know for sure. That's the only way to get a diagnosis. A physician needs to, to uh, uh, interpret and diagnose the sleep study. Only board certified sleep physicians are allowed or are, are qualified to, to do the diagnosis and to interpret and read the sleep study. Insurance companies are going to need a signed copy. Also, it's the standard of care, and I'm all about the standard of care. Dr. Dunn talked about uh, how dentists have gotten a bad rap because they've gone off like cowboys and made quote unquote snore appliances and failed to diagnose sleep apnea. And it, it, it's given the profession, I, I think a deserved uh, black eye. And I'm all about stopping that. And the way you develop a practice, a referral based practice is to work uh, closely with the medical community and do things the proper way. So what about treatment, okay? You know, what do we do for treatment? And obviously this is an effective method, uh, but probably not gonna work. Well, traditional treatment has been CPAP. Uh, CPAP's been around now since uh, the early 80s. Uh, it, it's come a long way, uh, but it, again, it's still the same blower type of device that blows air into the airway to keep the tube open, okay? That's basically all it's doing. And there's various styles of CPAP various interfaces, and you can see here the nasal mask. There's also full face mask. There's one that goes completely over the face. It looks like a gigantic diver's mask. Uh, again, um, you know, certainly um, my sleep physician that refers to me um, tells his patients that, that say, you know, I don't want to have a CPAP. He just tells them, you know, I don't either. 
um, but you know, I need to let you know what your options are. And, and so that's how I get so many referrals. So probably from just two sleep physicians, there are 95% of the patients that come into my practice uh, because I took the time to develop that uh, relationship. And I wanna help you to develop those relationships as well and to develop your practice. This is how people see CPAP, okay? And, uh, and I've heard patients actually say that my wife says I sound like dark with the sound of the CPAP. Even though they've gotten quieter, et cetera, et cetera, they do make a noise and they sound like Darth breathing. We all know what that sounds like. So you know, with CPAP, you know, the compliance is, 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 is abysmal, okay? Um, you know, 10, between 10 and 60% are still using it after the first year, depending on the study. Um, I think most of the review articles say about about a little under 50% are still using it after the first year. And the criteria to be considered compliant uh, under Medicare guidelines, the bar is set very low, okay? Um, five nights per week for four hours per night, and you're considered compliant. Well, do that math. That's 20 hours per week of sleep that you're using a CPAP to be considered compliant compliant when we know that uh, proper amounts of sleep for adults are in the seven to eight hour range per night. So we're talking about out of 50 hours of sleep, only having the CPAP on for 20 hours, okay? So way less than half of the time. Uh, the problem lies with follow-up and with uh, uh, patients understanding why they're getting this. There really is no follow-up. It goes back to the primary care physician um, who really is busy and uh, really doesn't understand and, and, and have the ability to really work with patients. And so, you know, this is what's happening. And that's, these physicians have prescribed thousands and thousands of CPAPs over the year, over the years. One company, um, ResMed, who is the second biggest uh, uh, provider or, or manufacturer of CPAPs, did a survey, and this survey is already at least six or seven years old, that there were over 900,000 unused ResMed CPAPs in the United States alone, and they're a multinational company. So um, we have the best product. We have an appealing alternative that works great, that's easy to use, that's um, accepted by the patient and the bed partner at a much higher rate with a compliance rate that's up, upwards of 80% uh, after the first year. So we really have it over the CPAP and with these simple oral appliances and here's um, you know here's a, a group of them and I'm not advocating one over the other because I can't because the literature does not support one being better than another although I, I have my preferences and I think my patients do too and I'm all about making sure that I have a device that my patients are comfortable using. Now the good news is you don't have to know about every single appliance. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to be your mentor and help you because if you're just starting out, you're not going to know an, an all the parameters that you need to know about which appliance to choose. And I can tell you that I've made the wrong choice early on, on many times and had to, you know, eat it and remake another appliance. You know, you don't want to have a showdown with a patient who's not able to use your appliance. So I'm here to help for that. But the really good news is that the records that you're going to obtain, first of all, you can see that these are just easy records. You don't even have, these are below your pay grade, doctor. But the records for any one of these appliances that I just showed you, that's it. They're the same for every single appliance that you're gonna, you can possibly make. Uh, so you know, the good news is that you get your beginning records and you, know, you, you call me up and I'll help you. Uh, we'll talk about the patient. Uh, some specific information about the patient, and we'll make a decision on which appliance to make. And there's many factors that go into this, the age of the patient, uh, the physical health of the patient, how much you want to spend on your appliance. I mean, the, there's, there's a myriad of, of questions that I would have to help you to choose the best appliance that works for your patient and for your practice. Oral appliances are, are proven, okay? And this is the practice parameters uh, that came out in 2005, uh, reviewing uh, oral appliances, the, the parameters for the use of oral appliances. This was a review of, of 10 years worth of literature, multiple centers and academicians 
uh, did the uh, analysis of the of the studies, and they concluded that uh, oral appliances are indicated for use in patients with mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea who prefer them to CPAP. Okay, that means anybody who's in the mild to moderate range, oral appliance first line treatment with very few exceptions is is an appropriate first choice. Okay. Uh, the, the study goes on to say that for more for severe patients that maybe they should try a CPAP first. Well, uh, the parameters were updated in 2015. And in 2015, uh, uh, the standard guidelines came out that um, any patient, and this is the number three here, any patient uh, who uh, does not want to have or you know, d refuses to have uh, a CPAP, whether they're mild, moderate, or severe, uh, the sleep physicians should consider um, referring to dentists to provide oral appliances. Only dentists can make oral appliances under the law. Physicians cannot. That would be considered practicing uh, uh, dentistry without a license. So this is the first time that these recommendations have come out because uh, that, that severe patients could have an oral appliance as first line treatment because of the, the proven effectiveness of oral appliances to relieve some of the complications, the, the, the medical complications of obstructive sleep apnea. Also, this is the first time that they recognize that snoring, chronic loud snoring in and of itself is a very harmful and recommending that oral appliances be prescribed rather than no treatment for patients who don't have, whose condition doesn't rise to the level of sleep apnea and yet have snoring. So the guidelines have been changed uh, and I think it's allowing us to treat many, many more patients. Um, I just did one of our uh, monthly conference calls that I do with our, our um, you know, for our client doctors, uh, all about snoring and primary snoring and how you can treat that and also how you can get paid through the medical insurance because I think it, it's very important that your practices get paid well for this service uh, because you can and that's where knowing how to do medical billing, uh, not in your practice, but having a good medical biller comes in. You know, our motto, Nicole and I started this company at the beginning of 2012. So we've been at it now for, for quite some time. It, it's been um, seven years and, and going on our eighth year and it's going strong, okay? Our motto is that, you know, just add water and stir, okay? It's a comprehensive program, it's a mentorship program. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit also about marketing to your existing patient base. Um, Studies show that up to 25% of the people, folks that are you know, coming into your reception room, obviously they're not gonna be packing in there anymore, but they're still coming in, uh, have undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea. Now, many of them have CPAP, so you gotta ask that question because the last thing you want is your patient who had a CPAP to come back with an oral appliance and tell you, oh yeah, I went to um, you know the, this dentist uh, down the street and I got an oral appliance. And now um, when you do this crown for me, doctor, I'm gonna need to go back to him or her to have it adjusted. You don't want that. You wanna know if your patients have CPAP and offer them a, a, an alternative. Um, so uh, again, um, you know, most of them who have it are, you know, don't like them or don't want to use them. You certainly can have this conversation with your, your patients. And again, your team members are the ones to have this conversation because your job uh, really is to maintain your restorative and surgical side of your practices. So any of your uh, team members can have the conversation. Uh, I think Dr. Dunn was asking, you know, who who uh, has these talks in, in, with the patients in his office. And yeah, he has a Jessica, who's her, his point person. I have my Lisa, who's my point person. But, but the, the answer is everybody talks about it in your practice because that's how you get the word out and you get patients to get involved in treatment. So you know, let, let's do a little bit of calculating here. So 25% of your patients that come in have obstructive sleep apnea. So let's say that you, know, you got eight patients in hygiene each day and you're working four days a week. So that's you know, 32 patients uh, eight patients per week, 32 patients a month, okay? If only if, if a quarter of the patients every single day have it. Uh, you, so you can see this math works out you know, quite easily. And let's say that you know, your 
only able to treat a quarter of these patients. Only a fourth of them agree to, you know, get tested and get treated. Well, you know, average reimbursement through PPO insurance um, in our practice is about $3,500, okay? Well, so let's do that math. Eight patients per month at $3,500 comes out to $28,000 in production per month that you wouldn't have had before, okay? That's just with your existing patient base. Uh, so, and you don't have to add team members. This is something that can be delegated. In fact, for the follow-up visits for your sleep apnea patients, uh, the reality is it could be your roving, rover assistant who you know, does the dishes in your practice can be trained to, um, to, to do this, to, to do the follow-up, and then simply call you in and give you the details so that you can then order a, a, a change or an adjustment to the appliance. You don't have to do that adjustment. Initially, yeah, you'll be having to do it. You're going to have to get real adept at working with these patients and delegate, and then training your team so that they can then take over for some of these, these procedures. But this is also what DSM Solution does. We help you to incorporate this into as a team approach so that the rest of your team is involved. Uh, external marketing, Dr. Dunn talked about is radio advertising. Uh, I've done very well with print advertising and billboards. I'm in a, in a community, well, I'm in Southern California in the Los Angeles area. Radio advertising spreads out over such a wide swath that uh, it just doesn't, isn't economical for me to do that because I'll be reaching out to people who live you know, 60 miles, 70 miles away from my practice and they, it just would be impossible to expect them to drive through uh, Los Angeles traffic uh, you know, to, to come to my practice. So print ads locally, um, this is work. This is how both Dr. Dunn and I really jump-started our practice. When we talked the other day, I said, you know, Rick, um, this, this advertising gave me the entree to the physicians and the sleep physician to, to uh, you know, to develop my practice because now I'm getting patients from a sleep physician who's lost track of their, his patients because they've stopped using their CPAP, stopped going to that physician. I'm getting them and now referring them back to the sleep physician for co-management once these patients get their oral appliances. So that was huge for me. Um, your website, also marketing your website and having a good company like Dentainment to put together an effective website uh, and, and have your website being found, whether it's through uh, organic search or pay-per-click or combination, I think that's key because we do get a, a number of patients every month calling in because they found us on the internet by looking for alternatives to CPAP. Training is critical. Okay, uh, Dr. Dunn talked about it, uh, but getting your, your initial training is just so important. And even if you've had some training, uh, enhancing your level of care and uh, uh, but through more training and also training your team is so important. And also, look, we're not uh, willing to go you know, schlep off to uh, webinars in crowded rooms, especially now. Uh, our program has always been web-based. We've always done it through live webinars, and it means no travel. And now more than ever, no travel is really critical because I don't think I want to get on an airplane anytime soon and sit next to people that I don't know and breathe the air you know, through with people that I don't know because you know, the risk of this, you know, this horrible virus. So um, the mentorship that we offer, I, I think that's what sets us apart. You can always get me on the telephone, you can get me through a text, you can get me through email, and I'm here to help you with all of your cases every step of the way through, you know, it, it, as long as it takes, but oftentimes it does take many months to develop and to put this all into place. And I want you to avoid the mistakes that I made. Again, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a diplomat of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine. I talked about advocating for the standard of care, and I want to help you achieve your goals by talking to you about your practice. Nicole wants to talk to you about your practice, talk to your team members, and uh, develop a, a way to put this into your practice um, in, in a meaningful, effective manner. Uh, we're available really 24-7. This is Nicole's first full-time job. I'm in my practice, but again, 21 hours a week, I have plenty of time for teaching, 
And you know, if this is something that's interesting to you, you know, we we and because of our mentorship, you know, we accept a limited number of clients. I, I will tell you, we have a limited number of select clients that that will accept because we want to be able to work with the best to help them to develop what they want uh, for their practices. Um, systems are very important. Uh, we help you with systems, uh, documentation that you're going to need, checklists. Um, and, and you also, you can see, you get a, a, a flash drive of all of this so that when you get your notebook, it will have all the forms that you need. They just won't be personalized on your own stationery, but that's something you can do after you've exhausted the documentation that we provide with you, for you. We want you to be able to treat patients after the first two hour session that you would have, the doctor would have with me, and the first two hour session that Nicole would have with the team and hopefully the doctor would participate in that as well. And doctors, I hope your team would participate in the sessions that you do with me as well. Um, you can offer them uh, CE for, you know, for, for your state, um, that it's California CE, but it does uh, translate to other states as well. Uh, and also puts everybody on the same page. Um, we can help you get your sleep studies done. We can figure out what the best way for you in your area, in your practice is to do uh, to get your sleep studies, whether you're going to purchase your own testing unit or use a third party. I'm all about helping you to figure out the best way, the most comfortable way, uh, maybe, you know, maybe the most economical way, especially now, to put all of this together. Uh, medical billing is critical. Dr. Dunn talked about it. Uh, the good news is that medical billing uh, can be, there are medical billers that are expert at it. Um, you can do it yourself, but I don't recommend it. I, I think that uh, many of us are working to get out of the insurance business, to get away from uh, managed care type of, of environment in our, in our dental practices, to have a true fee-for-service practice. That's what I have. That's what I developed about 10 years ago. And I can tell you, it, it, it's so liberating not to have to deal with uh, dental insurance companies and having my fees dictated by a third party because that limits the range of services that I can offer in my restorative practice and in my surgical practice. Um, your office manager or whoever your point person is, you know, they, they don't, if you have a medical billing company, they do not, your, your team does not have to deal with the insurance companies. All you have to do is be organized with your scanner and scan all the documents and send them to the medical biller who will handle everything. If you get a denial or, or a request for more documentation, uh, they, all they have to do is just send it to their medical biller. Your medical biller will handle it for you and you can, you can incorporate it into your day to day. So medical billing will connect you. I mean, DSM, you know, we, we have medical biller that we've vetted and that we've been working with the same medical biller now for, oh, probably six or seven, six years or so. Uh, we, we started out, you know, trying various companies, but we finally found an excellent uh, medical billing company. And the good news is that your medical biller does not get paid unless you do, okay? Um, the medical biller, um, will work for on a percentage. There are also medical billers that will work on a flat fee, and that's going to be up to you. I can help you no matter which way you want to go, get hooked up with a, a good medical biller. Um, medical insurance pays well, okay? Um, uh, I haven't been back in my practice um, you know, in a while, but this, this was you know, this check came in uh, not that long ago. And you can see this was for a single case that this kind of payment came in to us. Uh, here's another example as well. And, you know, not that we get these whoppers every, you know, all the time, but it, it is not uncommon to, you know, to get these you know, once or twice a month to get a very large check. Uh, Dr. D and talked about Med Medicare. Uh, I'm a proponent of becoming a, a Medicare provider. Again, we can talk about that and we can help you to get your Medicare durable medical equipment uh, provider permit uh, as well. Um, visit our website, okay? Dentalsleepapneatraining.com. Uh, again, that's our website. This is a beautiful website that was designed by Dent Kahneman, by Brad Newman. Uh, we're real proud of the website. Also, our clients will have access to all of our materials through the website, 
also all of the lecture materials that I uh, do uh, also get recorded and posted onto the website as well. So let's say you get a new team member, okay? That can happen, right? You can sign up with us six months later. Uh, so one of your team members has to leave. You got to get somebody else. You want to get them trained. We're here to help you with that as well. So I think I'm, I'm reaching the, the end of, of the line here. Uh, contact information, as you can see here, the telephone number, 818-561-6715. Uh, uh, you can also email at info at dentalsleepapneatraining.com. So I am also going to jump in very quickly. Um, a, a third option, if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, we do have a join now button on the website that you can click to instantly sign up with DSM Solutions, become a member, and within 24 hours have full member access, meaning access to that client portal that Dr. Greenman did mention. So um, you know, maybe we have time for uh, maybe a couple of questions. I know we, we, we've run a little, you know, uh, quite a bit over our hour. I, I got carried away talking about a, a, a subject that, that's near and dear to me. So um, I, I think we do have a, a couple of questions. Um, Brad, if you could uh, uh, give them to me and, and I'll try to be brief. Yeah, um, basically uh, how, how can someone uh, obtain the one unit CE uh, the continuing dental education credit for this program? Like, do they reach out to Nicole or what's the best route to do that? I will go ahead and answer that again. Uh, yes, reaching out to me to schedule a complimentary consultation with myself and Dr. Greenman um, is, is definitely one way to uh, get your one unit of CE, or you can go ahead and hit the join now button on our website and I will include that in all your new member material. Wonderful. Well, I think that's fantastic. I'm looking at some of these other questions that came through. I think Dr. Greenman highlighted and touched on most of those uh, pretty much, but it's, it's amazing to hear Dr. Dunn's perspective of the whole program, how sleep has benefited his practice in Amiro, New York, and then to go into Dr. Greenman's presentation this is a tremendous opportunity and perfect time for someone who's been thinking about implementing sleep to go ahead and really make this a huge part of the practice. Uh, you know, you don't have to work anymore. You could delegate it to a team. It's having a huge impact on people's lives and benefiting their lives. And it's very profitable. Uh, it's incredible. I think the program is, is uh, clearly at the top of the field and, um, you know, if I was a dentist and I had a practice, I'd obviously be a member. So thank you for sharing all this wisdom tonight. Oh, thank you for hosting, Brad. If, if you'd like, I'll type in your, your contact information and put it up on the slide. You, you are so sweet, Dr. Uh, Dr. Greenman. How about this? Anyone who's interested in getting a hold of me, just go to dentalsleepapneatraining.com and at the bottom of the website, you can click on Dentainment. I'd rather have them go to your website first. <laughs> thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank no, you, and thank you, everyone, for, no, for uh, joining no. us this evening. Big thank thanks you. to Dr. Dunn as well. And, and uh, one, uh, one more important update, uh, all of your amazing uh, educational content that you've compiled over the years, incredible webinars and programs that you've provided for your clients, there's a really nice updated user experience and member experience on the website now. So... Uh, uh, and I know Nicole, congratulations, Nicole, on that. That's a huge update for DSM. So the, the content has always been epic, but now that, that client experience for DSM uh, and, that, and that client portal, it's, it's next level. So I'm very thrilled away, and that's going to be for you guys. All right. Well, love to everybody. Uh, thank you for, for being a part of this. Uh, thank, thanks again to, to Dr. Dunn. Um, and, and I'm so happy to, you know, to, to be able to work with you and also Brad for hosting. So with that, Nicole, why don't you sign us off and everybody. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Well, Stay safe, take care. healthy, and much love. Thanks too. so much. Take care. Mm. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.